Okay, good afternoon. I said good afternoon. <laughs> uh, my name is Herb Boyd, and uh, I'm an escapee from Harlem. No, uh, we're here at Race, no, Pace University, and, <laughs> and, uh, and happy St. Patrick's Day, okay? He freed the uh, snakes in Ireland. He should have come over here. Uh, the United Snakes of America. We could have used St. Pat around here. Occupy Malcolm X. Hmm. Well, there's a lot of controversy um, as a result of the publication of Manning Marable's book, Malcolm X, A Life of Reinvention. And it spurred all kind of uh, responses, and critical conversations, and uh, just to contextualize that a bit for you, about two years ago, about this time of the year, uh, Henry Louis Gates, many of you know of his work, uh, he wrote an op-ed piece in the New York Times in the slavery blame game. Some of you may recall that. Certainly, I know, Bill, you recall that. And we were a number of the activist scholars we were very upset about that. And uh, we started a series of uh, conference calls in which we were going to gather kind of a collective response. A number of uh, responses went back to the New York Times, including a letter that I wrote and it published there. And we used that as a kind of something to precipitate a broader discussion. And we started these uh, tele teleconferences, at some point it was at least 15 of us on the line. And we were going to pull together a document, kind of a black paper, if you will, to respond to uh, Henry Gates's assertions, allegations, that some 90% of the uh, African captives was facilitated in a very complicit way by the African chieftains and other African uh, people involved. And we absolutely took exception to that and realizing even as the subsequent and looking at the rise of the plantation and Jim Crow in this country, that the African chiefs certainly didn't benefit from this. So after a series of calls and we began to commission people to do pieces, it was a pretty arduous process that never really materialized. It's always difficult when you have a situation like that and you're trying to gather together you know, a number of respondents and, of course, the academics and the scholars and the activists, they got their own agendas and their own schedules. So it was just unrealistic. It was not done. All of that had grown out of something that many of us remembered all the way back to 1968 when William Styron came out with his book, The Confessions of Nat Turner. Again, there was outrage about that book and Styron for the most part, had, uh, he called it meditations on history. We call it messing with our history. And he just did a terrible job in the mischaracterization of Nat Turner, turned him into like a, a sniveling, uh, someone who was uh, more than in, not interested in revolutionary struggle, but in the pursuit of white women, and a number of other devolving aspects that we just took exception to. Uh, Dr. John Henry Clark, my mentor, he then gathered together at least 10 black scholars to respond to that. And, and ultimately, a book came out. 10 black writers respond to William Styron's The Confessions of Nat Turner. So many of us, uh, two years ago, when we had in mind of dealing with Skip Gates, we were thinking back to the whole Styron incident. Fast forward nine months ago. When Manning Mirabal, who made his departure, tragically, ironically, on April the 1st, three days before the book came out. And I always compare that to what happened with, uh, with Malcolm X, who, who departed before he had a chance to see the completion of his uh, autobiography. <clears throat> Again, the outrage 
And then the idea of like assembling a number of thinkers to respond to what uh, Manning had put out there because the title alone was infuriating and very disturbing that he was saying that it's a reinvention. We took exception to that particular concept because it connoted that it was a certain kind of deliberate manipulation for personal gain, that this was an opportunistic move, that all of these different phases of his life as we saw it as political evolution and transformation. And it was just maybe a poor choice of words on his part to say reinvention. And so it was like a hundred reviews came out on Manning's book. It was all over the place. I mean, all of the mainstream media jumped on it. And Michiko Kukatani and the New York Times and David Remnick across the board an absolute praise for it in the mainstream media. On the other hand, coming from certainly on the, online, there were a number of people who were just strongly opposed and firmly in opposition to what uh, Manning had uh, put forth in the book. So I got together with uh, Dr. Ron Daniels and Dr. Molana Karinga and Dr. Dr. Haki Madhubuti. You see, it's always good to surround yourself with all these doctors, right? and decided that, hey, we need to do something about this situation. And um, so we started reading all the reviews out there. If you go to Abdullah Kalimat's site, Brother Malcolm, which is one of the better sites out there, he has like posted a hundred reviews of the book. And I've read most of them and then shared them with uh, my colleagues and we made a determination that we would gather 35 of them at that point. Uh, almost with, uh, I think, the majority of them, 75% of them were negative. And of course, we could have taken far more, but we decided just cut it off at that point and take some of the, the more, I'd say, informed discussions, because we wanted to have a critical conversation on this issue. And we tried to be as even-handed about it as possible. But given the, the overwhelming majority was negative, it was pretty hard to, to balance it out and decided that there was no way we were going to do that. We'll go with the consensus. Um, even the title, and two or three of our uh, contributors were somewhat concerned, and perhaps you'll hear a little bit more about that, that even the title seemed to kind of, kind of skew it in a, such a way that it was like, hey, mm-mm. It's kind of, is this an anti-Manning Mirabal book and what have you? By using a title, by any means necessary, and Malcolm X, real, not reinvented. Uh, but nonetheless, you had at least nine other people who agreed that what Manning, and even some of the people who were absolutely concerned about uh, the kind of content that he had there, uh, still raised some, some very serious uh, reservations about the book. And those who were totally opposed had some redeeming things to say. So we, I mean, you have to read through the book to get a feel for, you know, how it was, uh, how it breaks down in terms of the, the proportion of those opposed, pro and con. Anyway, we, we decided that in nine months, you know, we were going to put this book out and with Haki Madhubuti aboard and Third World Press, it was like uh, that kind of gestation period you know, was realized and the book just came out a month or so ago and it's been going very well. We've had several events, many more that are planned. And, and so you see the, the context in which all of this discussion and one of our con contributors, Amiri Baraka, he's not here yet. I'm not sure exactly where he is at this point. Perhaps he'll arrive in time and we should also note that Sonia Sanchez, who had also been scheduled to appear. I talked to her this morning in Philadelphia, and she's completely exhausted. I mean, they just, she's all over the place and had three or four events coming up, so she couldn't make it, but she wanted me to extend to you that, by all means, read her poem. I think the, the poem that she writes there for Malcolm, where she talks about, uh, you know, do not talk to me of martyrdom. You know, those people who die to be remembered on some perished day. She says, I don't believe in dying, though I too shall die. 
and like violets into castanets will echo me. Yet this man, this dreamer, thick-lipped with words, will never speak again. But to a certain degree, and that's the opening parts of a poem that she wrote back in 1968 that's in a book that uh, Dudley Randall uh, and Margaret Burroughs did. And Dudley Randall was an outstanding publisher and poet out of Detroit, Broadside Press. And Haki, you know very well of that, huh? In terms of, third of the Broadside Press. And do I see coming, I thought I saw Amiri coming down. Oh, it is a Mary, okay. <laughs> da, 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 da. <laughs> the Grand Inquisitor is here. Thank you very much, Amiri, for showing. I've been trying to reach you. <clears throat> but anyway, let me quickly get this introduction out of the way because now that we have Amiri here, we can truly officially begin and say to you that that poem then uh, was published in a book for Malcolm back in 1968. And Dudley Randall, if you've never heard of Dudley Randall, he had his most famous poem was, uh, it seems to me, said Booker T, I don't agree, said W.E.B. And kind of summarizes the whole discussion, debate, tension between Booker T. Washington and W.E.B. Du Bois back long before many of you were even thinking about African American history. So Dudley Randall departed, and we lost him in the year 2000. But there's a very fine documentary that you can pick up called A Black Unicorn, and I certainly would recommend that you check it out. Margaret Burroughs, uh, Haki, what she died a couple of years ago. And she, um, she was a founder of DuSabo, a co-founder of DuSabo Museum in Chicago. If you ever get to the Windy City, you get to Chi-Town, you gotta check out DuSabo Museum. In the same way, if you go to Charles H. Wright Museum in Detroit or the Schomburg here uh, in uh, New York City, it's equivalent. It's along that line in terms of what it means. I think the Moreland Spin Garden is with Howard Dotson down there, would show some kind of uh, revival as well. It was in desperate straits, but with Howard there, it's certainly going to be uh, infused with some fresh energy and insight. So that's 1968, and we said we were going to use that poem again because it establishes a certain kind of tone that we wanted. And of course, Sonia is just a remarkable poet, and we will return to her toward the end of this presentation to give you the last few stanzas of the poem, which I think is absolutely memorable. Okay, let's, uh, as they would say, <coughs> as I said last night, and there's a C-SPAN presentation coming up, what we did at the Breck Forum last night, and I said something about it's time to possibly, and people may take exception to this, to deconstruct the deconstructionists. <laughs> it's time to move into a discussion about the content of the uh, contributors we have here, what they have to say. <clears throat> but I think before we get underway, I want to have the publisher and that outstanding poet, writer, essayist, biographer, to give you a few words about the book, about the publishing company, and about his illustrious life. I give you Haki Madhabuti. Good afternoon. I'm really happy to be here. Um, I really have stopped going to events like this um, about 30 years ago. And primarily because I felt that um, the great majority of white people were not working in, in the best okay. interest of themselves other than corporate America, and most certainly not working in our best interest. And really did not start back working with um, progressive whites until um, I got a call from um, a poet by the name of Robert Bly. I guess you all know who he is. And Robert Bly was um, <clears throat> had these these men's meetings. He was trying to bring some consciousness to white men. And he had been working with uh, Etheridge Knight, who's a fine poet out of our tradition. 
and Ethers had died, and he called me, and he said, well, would you consider coming to this camp, this, these, this wooded area up in Virginia? I said, for what? Especially in Virginia. <laughs> and he said, well, we're going to bring this multicultural group of men together, and we need uh, somebody of your culture to be there. And I said, well, how much are you going to pay me? And he asked me how much I wanted. I gave him a price that I felt was more than adequate because it's for a week, a week in the woods with white men. <laughs> to make a long story short, um, it was a, an experience. I did meet a couple of men whom have remained friends to this day. Um, John Dinsmore, who used to be the drummer for the Doors, he came all the way from California and brought two black men with him and paid their way and everything. And he's been a friend since that meeting. And of course, Robert Bly has been a friend since that meeting. And then I got more involved with working with um, progressive elements of the white community when I began to uh, work with uh, the infamous uh, Bill Ayers and Bernadine Dorn. And we published Bill Ayers and Bernadine Dorn's book at Third World Press called Race Course, uh, dealing with the whole concept of white supremacy. Um, just a little bit of background. So when I came earlier today, <coughs> I, paid, I paid my $35 and got my badge and all that stuff. And walked around, brought back so many memories, so many memories. And last week I was uh, at the National Council of Black Studies in, in, in uh, Atlanta and seeing how they have developed and continued to move on. Herb Boyd and Ron Daniels and Marlana Karinga and I and even Baraka, we go back a long ways. I mean a real long ways. I mean Baraka is the oldest of all of us, but we go back a long ways. And he would look, get up here and say that I'm his grandfather, but he actually he's my grandfather. I just turned 70 um, three weeks ago. And um, it's been a long journey. Herb talked about Gates. We didn't do the book that we wanted to do on Gates, but I did a poem in one of my books called Run Toward Fear. Uh, and I'm just going to read the first. The, the title of the poem is But For Sale the gateway to factualization. And the first stanza reads, rising quickly under the umbrella of scholar extraordinaire, Professor Greats, Dr. Heavy, Loose Grace, AKA Jump Greats to close associates, friends and spelling buddies, recently of Yale, Cornell, Duke, and now residing permanently at the Cambridge of America. Anyway, it's a four page poem. But we're not here to talk about him, although I do think we need to have a, a real serious talk about Professor Gates. I found that publishing this book was actually an obligation. Most of you received uh, a small bullshit we put out um, about Third World Press. Third World Press will be 45 years old uh, in September, October of this year. We have in Chicago not only Third World Press, but we have four schools, uh, a preschool, new concept school, two elementary schools, the Betty Shabazz National School, and the Barbara Sizemore Academy, and the DuSable Leadership Academy. And we're servicing over uh, 1,000 children a day in an African-centered education. So we have a preschool, two elementary schools, and a high school. And all my adult life, I've been involved in this struggle all my adult life. Gwendolyn Brooks was a cultural mother of mine. And she wrote this about Malcolm. She said, original, ragged round, rich, robust. He had the hawk man's eyes. We gasped. We saw the maleness. 
the Milners raked out and made guttural the air and pushing us to walls. And in a soft and fundamental hour, a sorcerer, devout and vertical, beguiled the world. He opened us, who was a key, who was a man. Now, Gwendolyn Brooks's poem, Malcolm X, clearly defines without ambiguity the mission and medal of our fallen leader. Original he was, from his military-like stature and manner, rhythm, cadence, speech, eyeglassed and closed eyes that could detect smiling liars and an all-encompassing mind quicker than today's internet search. He did open us a door and remain the key that redefined black manhood while urgently issuing in a call for a richer personal credibility and a placing of the black family into the center of our lives, the placing of deep learning, cultural and economic responsibility, self-determination, and self-discipline, demanding organization and black institutional development. He was the key that opened a black world door for me. And for the co-editors, and Ron <clears throat> and Herb and Marlana, we're four men who have been influenced and culturally impacted by the life and work of Malcolm X, as well as the contributors. But most certainly, we saw Malcolm as a cultural father. And so my intentions in publishing the book and being involved in this project is not to supply a deep discussion on the pros and cons of Professor Marble's book, not me, but Malcolm X, a life of reinvention, all the contributors of volume, this volume, by any means necessary, do an adequate job in doing that. But as a publisher of this critical response and review collection, my goal is to bring clarity to the significance and importance of Malcolm X to me, our people, the Black Arts Movement, Pan-African and Human Rights Movement, and to thank him for putting me and us in a position to respond to this attack on him, his family, and by extension, all conscious black people. It is my responsibility as a cultural son of Minister Malcolm not to stand on corners throwing invectives at Professor Marble, but to use the tools of my profession as a poet, publisher, editor, educator, cultural intellectual, and black man to fight all white supremacist slander, even if it is produced by black people. I am serious as a first love. I am here, able, ready, and heaven did never detoured from the Pan-African path that Margaret and Charlie Burroughs, <coughs> Dudley Randall, Hort W. Fuller, Barbara Ann Sizemore, Willingham Brooks, and Malcolm X prepared me to undertake. As a dear friend of Dr. Betty Shabazz and their family, uh, in 1972, uh, Dr. Betty Shabazz came to my 50th birthday celebration, which was a fundraiser for our schools. She made a major donation at that time. And during the decade of the 1980s, she would regularly attend the National Black Holistic retreats that we had up in upstate New York of the National Black Holistic Society. I brokered the meeting, the public meeting at the Apollo Theater between Dr. Shabazz and Minister Farrakhan. And I was a Pan-African Nationalist family supporter who spoke at her last rites at Riverside when she was put to rest. I've always been in consultation with her, kind of a first responder to the Shabazz family needs as best I'm capable of doing. For me, Malcolm X was the first black man who had a national reputation that I saw in her speaking truth to his people and to power. Before I read Malcolm X, I was literally suffocating in a room of full of white air. Malcolm X helped to shape my young voice. His articulations were the immediate call and SOS to young black men and women who felt deeply that we needed a black leader that would push our agenda via direct action rather than always reacting to white world supremacy. 
His vision was one of a liberated African people functioning proactively, always in their best interests worldwide. And what I received from Malcolm in terms of how we moved to develop these independent black institutions in Chicago, and we do own a half a block in Chicago, was that you define what you're for and you put a laser beam on that and make it happen. And that's what we've tried to do. Therefore, I do not come to this issue as a non-participatory observer. Most people who know me and are my work understand the significant influence that Malcolm X has had on my life. I've dedicated many of my books, published poems and essays in respect to his life. I've said many times in public and in private that of the men who emerged in the 60s, I credit Malcolm X with liberating my voice and planting the seed of commitment to building independent black institutions in me. Malcolm X's foresight regarding the need to internationalize the black condition in the United States helped me in my later choices to become directly involved with the African liberation struggle. However, it was Malcolm's personal demeanor, his intelligence, his self-discipline, his study habits, his seriousness, his respect for family, political and cultural awareness, frugality, his honesty, strength in the face of evil fire, his work ethic, his boldness, his humility, his trustworthiness, his preparedness, his selflessness, and most of all, winning attitude and integrity that attracted me to him and his ideas. Most importantly, he came from the same street I came from and did not remain a victim. The distinguished historian John Henry Clark, who was a personal friend, supporter, and co-worker in the building of the Organization of African American Unity, OAAU, gives us a greater insight into Malcolm X and his influence. I'm going to skip some of this because I don't need, you, need, you can just read, buy the book and read it. Um, but Clark, as you know, honor Dr. Henry Clark, John Henry Clark, I'll just read this one quote about Malcolm. He writes, he was a man, one of the fastest learners that I've ever met in my life. You could give him information and he would read this information back to you, teaching you lessons over and above your instructions to him without offending you. He could speak to the reader and the non-reader, the college professor and the illiterate simultaneously, and the message would get across to them. Malcolm X is too big to fit into any kind of bowl marked communism, socialism, or capitalism. He was a believer in the ultimate destiny of his people. All right. Deep in the pit of my stomach, I knew that when Malcolm broke with the Nation of Islam, he also signed his death certificate. He knew this too. He could have had a life with his wife and children, an honor position in international struggle, and a materially comparable life he had remained silent. However, there is something inside men and women of honest conscience that now allow them to take the easy and safe compromise. There's something about being able to live with oneself and daily look at one's spouse, and children, family, friends, coworkers, in the face and tell them lie after lie after lie. For Malcolm, it was always a question of moral authenticity, the going subsurface to live one's life, one's words, always on honest search. And so we live in a short memory culture. White supremacy is a system that dominates black life from cradle to grave. And of course, within white supremacy, you have all the systems and subsystems. Occupy Wall Street is a part of trying to deal with that. I guess you all saw this uh, op-ed piece, piece in the New York Times the other day about Goldman Sachs, which is a real international criminal enterprise. But Malcolm knew all this at one point. But for us in the black community, Black life is seldom formally taught in our institutions or even less discussed informally. Malcolm X told our stories over and over again. 
each telling gaining substance and nuance as he grew, studied, struggled, traveled, dialogued with heads of states and others, debated with family, friends and foe, all making a statement on his ever-expanding maturity. His storytelling, especially his analysis of white supremacy, enabled us to tell our own stories without the customary editing by enemies and cowards. The moral and cultural imagination of Malcolm X transitioned into his own life, producing generations of cultural sons, cultural sons and cultural daughters, who do not tap dance to the latest feel-good tunes provided by government or corporate America. He arrived during a time of deep winter and it is still cold when snow falling, with snow falling during the summer months. This weather out here is not normal. It's not normal. I quote Charles W. Mills in his very important book, if you haven't read The Racial Contract. It's a very important book, writing about white supremacy. And so I'm gonna come on down because I'm not gonna read this whole thing. But I just wanna make it very clear to all of you and those of you who do not know me, is that you know, our commitment, my commitment, to black world struggle and African-American struggle in particular, ideally should be no less than his. To not try and reach his level of seriousness is to acknowledge our own failure, and just as important, will be a confirmation of black impotence. Such an action will confirm, will confirm us, confine us to the garbage bins of history. And people worldwide will continue to use black people as their catch line and their jokes. If anything can be said about Malcolm X is that he was not a comedian and he did not sell woof tickets. This too should be our call. Houston A. Baker, a uh, very important book that was published about three years ago, it's in paperback now called Betrayal. He writes of black intellectuals who have worked incessantly against the legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. He names names rises above any ad hominem sensationalism, generalization, condemnation, and sketchalizing indiendos. Yet Dr. Baper is very serious in his analysis of their intent and outright betrayal of Dr. King's legacy. I'm not gonna quote him here. Since 1971, I've been a close friend to the Shabazz family. First meeting Betty Shabazz on a plane ride between Chicago and New York. The Shabazz daughters have suffered in unbelievable, in unbelievable ways, having lived through the tragic death of both parents, a story worthy of a Toni Morrison novel, yet this is not fiction. Professor Marbles has accepted the culture of say or write anything and prove me wrong. With total disregard for the political and cultural effects his words and accusations would have on anyone especially to the family, especially to the family. We must never forget that Meg Evers, Malcolm X, Betty Shabazz, Martin Luther, and Coretta Scott King are not only honored ancestors, and there are others too, but represent black America's first families of the last half of the 20th century. They lived and gave their lives in a struggle that is ongoing but has advanced to a state that we, their political sons and daughters, can now answer lies, innuendos, and outright defamation of character quickly without fear or favor from the institutions that we own, with, from the institutions that we own and do such liberating work. And finally, our work is not done with over 2.5 million incarcerated black and brown men and women in America's prisons, over 50% of black and brown high schoolers not completing their studies, with the black unemployment rate hitting over 50% in some areas, as black home ownership is becoming a nightmare in the international corrupt money game. The new Jim Crow, as Michelle Alexander writes in her major work, is more subtle, yet 10 times more effective in the dismantling and negation of black communities. Yet we still keep getting up, walking taller, breathing deeper. As Isabel Wilkerson recants in her marvelous epic of our great migration, migrations, the warmth of other sons, Malcolm X taught us to confront our worst fears, whether it is Wall Street, 
the corporate state, the small money elite represented by the likes of Goldman Sachs, Bank of America, Citicorp, the Supreme Court and the Citizens United ruling and other legal gangsters. We must remember that pre-Malcolm X, many if not most black people of African ancestry grew up hating themselves. And one of the reasons we started our schools is because we wanted to get these young children at two and a half years old and the first thing we taught them is to love themselves, to love themselves. It's critical. We don't love ourselves at the level we need to. So our mission, as Malcolm X would have it, is to build and resist, to resist and build. And in the middle of such struggle, never forget who we are and to love who we are and pass it on. If I was to suggest one book to keep us going on the right path of history and politics, it would be The Destruction of Black Civilization by Chancellor Williams. The documents and essays in this collection and her board is the lead editor. All right. And just want to thank him for all the work he's put into getting this book out. This is the first critical assessment of the Professor Marble's book, and I'm sure there will be would not be the last. In America, most of us grew up running from ourselves because we did not know who we were. Malcolm X played a significant role in stopping that. He knew that more than anything else, that self-knowledge was the beginning of self-empowerment. And I'll end as I begin with the powerful words of Gwilynn Brooks writing about Paul Robeson. She says, Warning, in music words, devout and large, that we're each other's harvest, we're each other's business, we're each other's magnitude and bond. Thank you very much. It's my leg. Oh. <laughs> oh, see, we're absolutely blessed. Thank my leg. <laughs> you know, they often say that, um, particularly when moderators and mistress and masters of ceremonies, somewhat at a loss to introduce someone, they always say, hey, Tony, uh, this person needs no introduction. And they kind of kind of get them off the uh, limb. But I think it absolutely applies in this situation when you talk about one Amiri Baraka, because in the annals and the canon, of our literary canon, and it's beyond just African American. We talk about the American canon. And the writers we've had produced in this country, certainly for their diversity and versatility, I think that uh, Amiri is incomparable and certainly compares with a James Weldon Johnson, with a Langston Hughes, with a Zora Neale Hurston. But beyond his versatility, you're talking about someone whose art and politics are never compromised and they blend in such a magnificent way. So it's always a pleasure to be in his company because you learn a little bit more each time with you when you spend some time with Amiri Baraka. I'll bring him to you, right? I was in Maribel's office waiting for him, and uh, he didn't show up. Uh, so finally I had to call somebody to take me back home. We were supposed to have a uh, discussion, a, what do you call that, uh, verbal history or uh, 
we were supposed to discuss my life, you know, he wanted to make some kind of a, a official verbal history of that. And then when I got home, I discovered that he had died, you know, the next day. Uh, the idea of, 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 of Maribel's book, because I wanted to say that, because he was a friend of mine, certainly. And I agreed with, say, the book he did on Du Bois and uh, some of his other writings. Uh, but this book on Malcolm struck me as peculiar, I'd say. Because the whole question about the reinvention of himself. It, f first of all, it seems like that uh, dismisses our actual meetings with Malcolm, his actual effect on us in the real world, you know. Uh, so why would he have to reinvent himself? What would that mean to, to try to uh, delve into some kind of reinvention? It's the first question. And, and certainly, um, to use the FBI and New York, New, New York Police Department files uh, would not contribute much to our understanding Malcolm, it would contribute us to understanding the New York police and the FBI. As a matter of fact, I got 3,000 pages of FBI, you know, files on myself. I could only afford 3,000 pages. They charged me $300 for the 3,000 pages. At first, the director of the FBI said he didn't have any pages on me. Uh, but then a friend of mine, Allen Ginsberg, had a lawyer looking for his papers so he got this lawyer to look for my papers, and lo and behold, Eureka, there was 3,000 pages. I was reading those pages, and my wife said to me, my wife Amina said to me, uh, well, why do you think they would show you the stuff that really happened? Why would they let you look at those pages? I mean, do you really believe they would show you the facts that they were dealing with? Which is a good question. The rest of the stuff is blacked out. The stuff that's not blacked out, the FBI is saying, read this. So you think that after all the skullduggery that they had gone through, that they would actually uh, show you what they were really doing. Also, I should think that the, the idea of post-racial, this is supposed to be post-racial uh, America. Now, you know that's a lie. I you know, whatever. You know, I mean, I support Obama. Well, I support Obama because I've seen the Republicans. Uh, <laughs> more than anything, and uh, you know, with that group of comedians, you couldn't do anything else but support Obama. But post-racial, but Afro-American people still have no equal rights. They still have no self-determination. So post-racial don't cut that, you see. We're still struggling pretty much in the same mode. You know, I would say this, uh, 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 Obama's politics, are a little more progressive than the Republicans by two or three inches. But there's still no equal rights or self-determination. So the question is this, what is it that you think Malcolm, what is the reason you think that making Malcolm uh, more human, that's what they say, the same thing they did with Martin Luther King on Broadway with that mountain side was mountaintop. Why is it that you're going to make them more human? Is it more human means we have less reason to follow them, to have followed them, you see? Uh, and I think that what Marable does basically, and I could read this essay, but I, I, you know, I don't want to do that. I think that what, 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 what Marable is guilty of, having belonging to the Democratic Socialists, which is not a Marxist organization, which are not Marxist-Leninists, who are actually the people that Lenin describes in his struggle with social democracy, you see, who is opposed to revolution, you see what I mean? Malcolm X was revolutionary, first of all, you know, no matter what you might think of that, he was a revolutionary. So it seems to me a lot of the talk uh, of Marable was to downgrade the nation of Islam. You might like, not like the nation of Islam, you might like, not like Muslims. You understand? But the fact is this, that the nation of Islam had more influence on the Afro-American people than the DSA ever had. 
that the, that the nation of Islam had more influence on, on black people than the Communist Party, and that the black liberation movement had more influence on the Afro-American people than any social democratic organization. And I don't think they can bring themselves to accept that fact, that these people selling them bean pies and them newspapers, you might not understand that, but they had more influence on black people than the Communist Party ever had. Now that's important that you understand that. Uh, so the downgrading of the Nation of Islam, the downgrading of the black liberation movement, which, you know, people say, well, they're not, the black liberation movement was not a Marxist, Leninist movement. Do you know Lenin, what Lenin said about that? And I'm gonna quote this, you know, because the revolutionary, and he said this in the foundations of Leninism, the revolutionary character of a national movement under the conditions of imperialist oppression does not necessarily presuppose the existence of proletarian elements in the movement. The existence of a revolution or a Republican program of the movement, the existence of a democratic basis for the movement, the struggle that the Emir of Afghanistan is waging for the independence of Afghanistan is objectively a revolutionary struggle, despite the monarchist view of the Emir and his associates, for it weakens, disintegrates, and undermines imperialism. Whereas the struggle waged by such desperate Democrats and socialists, revolutionaries and Republicans was a reactionary struggle. Lenin was right in saying that the national movement of the oppressed countries should be appraised not from the point of view of formal democracy, but from the point of view of the actual results as shown by the general balance sheet of struggle against imperialism. Now that's important to understand that the black liberation movement, the nation of Islam, et cetera, never presumed to be Marxist Leninists but presumed to be fighting against imperialism, and they'd done that. Uh, I just had this same struggle with uh, our friend Dyson uh, on Democracy Now. Uh, so I wanted to know why this intense desire to turn us away from what we actually observed as their leadership quality. Now, in terms of Martin Luther King and, and Malcolm X, I would say this, the reason that the movement, uh, that there was a split in the movement, if you remember the Montgomery bus boycott, you know what, they, what did they, boycotted the buses, you know, that's 1955, first uh, uh, Emmett Till murdered, Dr. King comes to Montgomery, the whole Montgomery bus boycott takes place. At the end of that boycott, when they had finally won, they blew up Dr. King's house in Montgomery. The black people show up with rifles saying, Dr. King, Dr. King, what should we do? He says, if any blood be shed, let it be ours. My generation is so not going to be like that now. <laughs> if any blood be shed, let it be ours. No, it ain't going to be like that. You know what I mean? We love you, Dr. King, but if people come here talking to prove their whiteness by killing us, we're going to try to kill them back. I mean, that's just, and so Malcolm appears at that time, and Malcolm says what? You treat people like they treat you. He says, if they treat you with respect, you treat them with respect. But if they put their hands on you, send them to the cemetery. That was the basic kind of division. Yet when I met with Malcolm a month before he was murdered at the Hotel Teresa with Mohammed Babu, who had just come back from making a revolution in Zanzibar, which uh, ended up being the Republic with Tanganyika, the Republic of Tanzania. Malcolm talked about the united front, the need for a united front, you see. Uh, it's interesting because I met Martin Luther King the week before he was assassinated. He came to my house. And you know, I saw these people coming up the street, helicopters and stuff. I thought we were getting busted. And it was Dr. King knocked on the door and said, hello, Leroy. <laughs> You don't look like such a bad person. <laughs> People told me you were a bad person. <laughs> but Dr. King said the same thing, that we need a united front, that no single ideology can make the changes that we need in this society. And that's obviously true. That's what Stokely Carmichael said all those years. Every time we talked, he talked about the need for a united front. We still have not learned that. 
we still think that if we are Muslims or Christians or Marxists or vegetarians, that somehow that will be the key to overthrowing uh, monopoly capitalism. But I say this, just like uh, Obama won that because, first of all, 90% of the black people said, no, you're going to be the president. 60% of the Latinos, 60% of the Asians, and a good part of the progressive white people, and all those are minorities. <laughs> <laughs> they finally said, you're going to win this. And I think that that kind of united front that actually elected Obama, whatever you think about him now, you must do that again in the face of the Republican, the right wing, you know. Uh, but the idea, uh, the fundamental idea here in this book here is that we're saying that there's a, 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 a disconnection. Is Maribel's failure to understand the revolutionary aspects of black nationalism as a struggle for self-determination, self-respect, and self-defense. A struggle for equal democratic rights expressed on the sidewalks of an oppressed nation, of an oppressor nation by an oppressed Afro-American nation. That's the most important thing. Uh, so there is much more from Marable framing Malcolm's murder, for instance, as the nation of Islam, rather than the state. You know what I mean? Uh, to, to set that up. Uh, Malcolm, uh, Marable's general portrait of Malcolm as a doomed and confused individual about whom he could say that Malcolm, quote, Malcolm exclusively read, extensively read history, but he was not a historian. Now that is an incredibly elitist statement. He read history, but he wasn't a historian. That is, that's out to lunch to me, to me, you know. Uh, as if the academic title historian conferred a, scient a more scientific understanding of history than any grassroots scholar might have. That's simple class bias, you know. Uh, and to say that the Nation of Islam was not a radical organization obscures the black nationalist confrontation with the right racist oppressor nation. Marabou thinks that the Trots or the Socialist Workers Party or the Communist Party or the Committees for Correspondence are more radical. But that means he has not even understood Lenin's directive, as I just read that to you. Uh, Marabou spends most of his time trying to make the uh, Nation of Islam Malcolm's murderers. Information from the FBI, boss, CIA, you know, New York Police Department, you know. Uh, Malcolm said one time when he came through France and French wouldn't let him in, he said his mistake was he made too much, he was spending too much time worrying about the nation of Islam and not enough time working about the United States government. And that's very important. Uh, But even as he, Marabou, keeps hammering away that it was the nation of Islam, he still says contradictorily, the fatwa or death warrant may or may not have been signed by Elijah Muhammad. There's no way of knowing. Well, many of his claims fall under that same category. There's no way of knowing. Uh, Marabou also tells us that even today, the FBI refuses to release its reports on Malcolm's assassination, even today. Yet he will quote one of those agencies without question. Of Betty Shabazz's death, Marable says flatly, of Malcolm's daughter, Kabila, her disturbed 12-year-old son set fire one night to his grandmother's apartment. How does he know this? You mean you just simply trust what the FBI says? Why should we? I don't understand the 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 the, the, the uh, logic there. Marable says that in effect that Malcolm misunderstood Martin Luther King's influence on black people. He didn't misunderstand that influence. He was trying to provide an alternative to it. He understood it only too well. You know, a whole generation understood that, you know, that we were not trying to, that we didn't misunderstand King. We didn't uh, believe that. Interestingly, on the back of the book, are three academics who represent the same democrat, social democratic thought as Professor Marable. Skip Gates, who disparages Africa. He looks for racism in Cuba, but not in Cambridge, and says that the Harvard Yard is his nation. My friend Cornell West, who in response to me calling out at the left forum, I said, where are the communists? Where are the socialists in here? He said, I'm a Christian. And I tried to point out what happened to 
Christ, you know, who, <laughs> who was supposed to be a Christian. And then Michael Eric Dyson, who wrote a book on Dr. King, calling it the true Dr. King, someone like Marable's approach to Malcolm. But who and what else in this paper garden of even are this post-racial America? So they are telling us that it's necessary that we view ourselves as real leaders in our struggle in favor of academics who want to tell us we were following flawed leaders with flawed ideas, although none of these Negroes would have those jobs if it wasn't for them flawed leaders with them flawed ideas. <laughs> telling us we should not follow our real leaders, but we should follow these academics who want to tell us we were following flawed leaders with flawed ideas. We don't need equal rights and self-determination. An appointment to an Ivy League school would do just fine. So uh, <laughs> that is, I guess, basically what I have to say about this book. I mean, uh, the only thing I add is that now, by now, we should all be seeing the, that the 911 gambit was really the doorway into the Middle East, that since they went through that door, they've been in Afghanistan, Iraq, you understand, they overthrew Libya, now they're trying to do the same thing to uh, Syria with their eyes on Iran. But I'll tell them one thing they need to remember. Iran is not Arabs, those are the Persians. Now you go back to your own history and check out the Persians, they'll tell you something you need to know. <laughs> Amiri, why don't you just say what you really feel, huh? <laughs> One of the um, most interesting of the contributors in the book is uh, my good friend, Bill Fletcher, Jr. Bill and I were members of the BRC, the Black Radical Congress. Um, I think I may have a little bit more of a unique distinction and also being a member of the Nation of Islam. I don't know if Bill was there or not. I don't know how many people can make that claim of being with the BRC and with the uh, Nation of Islam. You have to live a few years, I think, to make that kind of connection, huh? <laughs> but uh, what are the most, uh, I think, interesting thing about his uh, essay in the book is his analysis of the BRC and some of the, uh, I see a lot of my uh, colleagues who were in the organization I would certainly direct them to his assessment, his analysis of what happened with the BRC. I think it's one of the most telling uh, analysis that we can get on that organization. So it's almost like, a, I don't know, un unintended consequences that grows out of, a, of, a, of an essay on Manning Marable's book that we get that rich information about the BRC. But uh, Bill, I met him first when, I mean, as a union activist, a labor activist out there, we worked together on a book called Race and Resistance uh, that was put out uh, by the, um, by a bunch of lefties, huh, Bill? You know, they put the book out there and we did a good job there of talking about the history of the labor movement. Also with uh, TransAfrica, where he was a president, former president there with the Institute of Policy Studies, where I think he continues to be as a senior member, as well as uh, on the board at Black Commentator. And um, hey, let me bring you Bill Fletcher, Jr., okay? <laughs> Thank you, Herb. Good afternoon. Um, I want to thank Herb, and I also want to thank Haki uh, for having uh, invited me to uh, contribute to the book that was mentioned on the collection of essays on, uh, in response to Manny Marable's book, Malcolm X, A Life of Reinvention. I also want to say that um, as a younger baby boomer, it's both difficult and exciting to be on this panel, because I can say it's good to be on a panel with my elders. Um, okay. No, it's good. It's real. Um, 
Before I get into my, my words, I, I don't want to say this has been, this is one of the most difficult exchanges over the last year. Um, for me, uh, someone that at the age of 13 read the autobiography of Malcolm X one, uh, one fall and uh, found that that book changed my life uh, and to encounter people around the world who had a similar experience, um, it's, this discussion has been painful. Uh, and it's been complicated. But I want to start there because I want to say that this discussion should not be about people's love or respect for Malcolm X. See, once we've established that Malcolm X was not the Messiah, nor was he the Mahdi in either the Sunni or Shia traditions, it should at least theoretically be possible to engage in a discussion about Malcolm and his legacy. The one obstacle to such a discussion, however, was summed up by one activist when they proclaimed shortly after the publication of Marable's book that the people need icons. When I read this, I realized that what it actually meant was that some people believe that it is neither possible nor appropriate to undertake a materialist examination of our beloved brother. And further, that anything that suggests that Malcolm was anything less than perfect somehow betrays our love and respect for our great and fallen leader. The controversy that surrounded the publication of Marable's book was extraordinary less, in my opinion, due to the content of the controversy and more due to the tone. Leaving aside that Malcolm had just died, the anger, the homophobia, and indeed hatred was venomous. It was noteworthy in that attacks on Marable's character and politics were undertaken not only by historic opponents of his, but also, at least in some cases, by individuals who Marable considered to have been his friends and comrades, individuals who, in some cases, Marable generously supported in various ways. I decided in speaking here today not to go tit for tat in this odd debate, I don't mean that this is odd, but the larger debate, except to make a few points, after which I want to address some of what I believe to be the key issues raised in Marable's book that are worthy of further exploration. First, this will not be the last Malcolm X book. However, the standards set by Marable of over 10 years of in-depth research will be a challenge for any further writers. Second, it is clear, should we wish to be honest, that the attacks are largely about Marable. I've written some about this and will not belabor the point. The bottom line is that Malcolm X was commodified after his death, not only by the capitalists, particularly in the 1980s, but by, even by some on the left and the nationalist movements. These individuals, either through conferences, bookstores, or other items, came to believe that they, and only they, could lay claim to the legacy of Malcolm X. Marable, in that sense, was an interloper as far as they were concerned, not to mention an academic at a prestigious university. But a related point is that Marable dared to push the life and work of Malcolm X into the mainstream stage, but from the left. For some individuals, this was simply impermissible. Malcolm X was to be worshipped in private and, at best, within an all-black arena. Third, some of the criticisms are simply silly, if not examples of sophistry. Let me offer an example that struck me. One former colleague of Marable criticized the book for allegedly distorting Malcolm's life and legacy. The example that this person pointed to was Marable's reference to how Malcolm would have supported the Durban UN World Conference Against Racism. This writer indicated that Malcolm X would never have supported a dialogue with imperialists. I was struck by this criticism, so I went back to, to look at the book. If you read what Marable actually said, it will indicate that this critic was simply wrong in his interpretation and his facts, not to mention his intent. Marable was talking about the NGO forum that was connected with the UN World Conference Against Racism, where progressive forces from all around the world, including people that are sitting in this room, gathered. Yet I do not believe that this critic was so stupid as to not have known this, though I might be wrong. I think that this was simply a jab at Marable, an, attempt, an attack, attempt to take him down a peg and to delegitimize the book. 
The attempt failed. Another example, often touted by some well-intentioned comrades, was a reference in the final chapter, chapter to Malcolm X, Malcolm X adopting an alleged race-neutral approach to his theory, with Pan-Africanism and Third World Solidarity to use as examples. Marable was jumped upon like white on rice for this reference. Now, the reference is peculiar. I read an earlier draft of the book, and that reference was not there. I concluded that one of two things happened. It was either a poor choice of words by Marable, or the editor made the change. But let's assume that it was a poor choice of words. Is there anything in the work and writings of Marable to lead any person not suffering from Alzheimer's to believe that Marable could possibly have meant race neutral in the way that the term is used in the US today? Of course not. Marable was pointing to the challenge that Malcolm X, Malcolm X himself acknowledged of how to describe his evolving politics. There was some combination of revolutionary nationalists, pro-socialists, pan-Africanists, third worldists, with a bit of Islamism thrown in there for good measure. But Malcolm acknowledged after speaking with a North African light-skinned revolutionary that black nationalists as a term might not adequately describe his evolving views. Perhaps race neutral was an editor's interpretation of the expression non-racial, a term that is used in South Africa to describe anti-racist politics, but a term that we do not use here in the US. Given Marable's affinity with the South African movement, he may have used it. Having had my own issues with editors, I can believe that this might have been changed by a US editor attempting to, unsuccessfully, make this clearer to a US audience. In any case, there are other people who were much more intimately involved with the writing of this book, such as Zahir Ali, who can go head to head with anyone on the particulars of the book. Let me suggest that the book stands as a marvelous contribution to the ongoing discussion of the life and work of Malcolm X. Perhaps when my generation is dead, a generation that venerated Malcolm, a generation that had Malcolm at the heart of our politics, perhaps only then will we be able to step back and truly examine Malcolm X's life and work without obscene and infantile efforts to impugn the character of this or that writer. Let me shift to a few of the critical points in the book that I believe to be worthy of serious discussion. The circumstances of the assassination, questions of organization, gender, and reform and revolution. The assassination is worthy of discussion alone, not only due to the information that Marable re reveals about the possible assailants, but also about the circumstances that made the assassination possible. Marable proposes that three forces had an interest in Malcolm's de demise, the Nation of Islam, the state, and some elements within his own organization. Malcolm found himself in a cul-de-sac by late 1964. He was moving at light speed compared with much of his organization. He was also driven by a fury at circumstances within the Nation of Islam that had led to his having been driven out. What was striking in reading the book was that you want to yell at Malcolm and beg him to pull up, to be more careful tactically. Yet he kept prodding the nation of Islam. The state clearly wanted his demise, so there's little to discuss there. But it was this question of people within his own organization that caught my attention, and it relates to several other factors. Malcolm had a set of loyal followers who were not necessarily with him politically. As Malcolm evolved, they did not necessarily, and precisely on a matter of gender, as women were starting to rise, they did not necessarily uh, adopt the same views as he. And this created an immense amount of tension with some of the older male followers. On top of this, Malcolm had two organizations that he was attempting to manage. It is, in fact, this matter of organization that jumps out at the reader. Malcolm needed to have a general secretary or executive director who was clearly empowered to lead the organization. Yet Malcolm appears to have been unclear about the division of labor between himself and some of his chief aides. This challenge reminded me of the building of the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters and a division of labor which succeeded between its president, A. Philip Randolph, and its chief organizer, Milton P. Webster. Detailed in the book, Keeping the Faith, what struck me is that while Randolph was clearly the political leader of the Brotherhood, the organization would have gone nowhere without the brilliance of Webster, 
who was the person who woke, awoke every morning thinking about the challenges of organization. The relationship between these two individuals was critical. The matter of gender, as discussed by Marable, has been sensitive on several grounds, but is no less important. I'm not going to engage in a discussion about the possible same-sex relationship. When I read the draft of the book, that, that section was so unimportant that when the controversy arose with its publication, I thought it was from a different book. No, Malcolm was, for much of his life, not particularly at the vanguard of the struggle against male supremacy. He had a complicated view of his mother as well as of various women partners. He apparently had a caring relationship with Betty Shabazz, but done one that was not completely satisfying. He was willing to seek help in trying to work through the issues, but some of those issues appear to have revolved around unresolved matters concerning the woman who he had actually loved earlier and wanted to marry, but who ended up impregnated by Elijah Muhammad. But the story does not end there. During the final period of his life, his views seemed to change, and he actively engaged women in the construction of his ultimate political project, the Organization for African American Unity, or Afro-American Unity. This takes us full circle to the circumstances surrounding his murder. His breaking with the crude misogynism of his Nation of Islam days was linked to an evolution in his own politics that started, and we must say started, to envision a liberated view of women. This journey was far from complete. Finally, the issue of reform and revolution. Some critics have suggested that Marable attempted to describe a Malcolm X that looked like Marable. I found this sort of humorous. Though Marable worshipped Malcolm X, a point that seems to have gotten lost in much of this discussion, he was enough in touch with his own ego and personality, not to mention his politics, to know that he and Malcolm were very different. Malcolm was grappling with the interaction of reform and revolutionary politics and practices, something that is worthy of great examination. The combination of global solidarity and anti-imperialism on the one hand, with his interests, those are, that is the interest of Malcolm in electoral politics, points towards something like what ultimately came to be known as the National Black Political Assembly. In other words, the National Black Political Assembly was, in my humble opinion, a logical con conclusion from a set of Malcolm's politics. While it is true that Marable was connected with the outgrowth of the assembly, specifically the National Black Independent Political Party, Marable was not describing his own evolution. Malcolm was trying to address what it meant to engage in pro-black progressive politics in a non-revolutionary situation. He seemed to be open to various coalitions, but his views were, frankly and with all due respect, undeveloped and too underdeveloped to draw any major conclusions. I, for one, am interested in exploring these issues. Whether Marable sufficiently applauded other writers on Malcolm is not my concern. I've been going over, for example, Howard Zinn's People's History of the United States and noticed that he spent very little time commenting on other writers of US history. Zinn was interested in presenting a narrative before the people to spark debate and answer many questions with which activists and regular people have been grappling. Manning had a similar objective. There is little doubt that despite the protests and hurt feelings on the part of some who believe that they and only they hold the Malcolm X franchise, Marable succeeded. Thank you very much. I guess the question, I guess the first question I'd like to raise is, how many of you have read Manny Marable's book? Show of hands. Okay, okay. We always say, uh, if you don't read it, you know, no investigation, you have no right to speak. So a few of you are probably ready to speak. Uh, I guess we have a microphone here to kind of get the Q&A started. Maybe I'll open it up with a question to the panel. First of all, if the panel may want to respond to what some of their fellow panelists have to say before we go forward. But also, let me note that we're streaming live on Free Speech TV. I was just informed by the executive director, Don Rojas, my old comrade. And uh, so those of you who don't want to be seen, you know, be duly uh, warned and advised. Thank you. Amiri, go ahead. I know you've got uh, something to say. Well, you know, 
Well, first of all, the pull the microphone to you. Oh, Mary. I'm sorry. The question about Malcolm as a Messiah, I don't think, uh, unless you're talking about religious people, I don't think any of us, the Black Liberation Movement never held Malcolm as a Messiah. They simply thought his ideology was correct. Uh, and in terms of Malcolm's legacy, all those organizations like the Black Panthers, the Republic of New Africa, the Congress of African People, came from Malcolm's inspiration. You know, he was the most inspirational person of that generation. So, like, what actually it seems that you're saying is that the masses of us, the people who actually followed Malcolm because we thought that he was correct, that somehow that we were like either, we thought it was a religious kind of thing. And in terms of the thing about Malcolm X commodified, by whom? Who, who did that? You mean the, the media? Certainly, their, their commodification must have been uh, negative. And, and, the, and the comment about we weren't worshiped in private, I mean, that's just gratuitous insulting. I mean, you know, the, the fact that we, we, we followed Malcolm meant that we worshiped him in private. Uh, I think what's, what's, what's necessary is uh, we get comments, and again, that's what I was criticizing Marable. Well, we get these criticized by people who never agreed with Malcolm ideologically, who never th thought his, what he was doing was correct. You understand? And so now they're going to go around the edges of him, trimming him off in some kind of way. And that's what I, that's what I mean. Uh, what we need to have is a debate on the ideology of revolution. If you want to do that, we need to bring it right straight out front, rather than, you know, nipping at Malcolm's heels, you know. Because the question is, what ideologically do you think Malcolm was doing wrong, you know? Uh, and also, the, the, the black nationalism might not uh, describe Malcolm is evolution, that black nationalists, you know, I don't think it's a question of, black nationalists might not, but I think people who were following Malcolm's thought, you know, and determined to see that thought proceed past his death, you know, it's not a question that we wouldn't be able to describe it. Uh, the thing about Betty Shabazz, again, that's like some kind of marable. That was what marable was kind of saying, stuff like that. It wasn't satisfied. How do you know that? Was you in there with him? I don't I mean, that's just out to lunch, you know. But I, I, uh, uh, I just don't see that as, as any, I mean, unless you got proof, take photographs. Or... In terms of the National Black Assembly, I didn't understand what you were saying about that. You know, because I was the Secretary General of that, I would like to know what you were saying about that, what that meant. Uh, in terms of Malcolm's views being undeveloped, what did, would they be as developed, <coughs> your view of it, see? Because I think that's what we need. We need a discussion of the ideological kind of uh, uh, conflict that's going on, not some kind of sideways criticism of Malcolm that's really criticizing a whole ideological development. You know, that's, that's what I think. We need to come out with it. You know what I mean? Because I know the Social Democrats never did dig Malcolm X. You understand? And so to like pretend they dug him, but blah, 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 that's just a lot of, well, you know what you call it. <laughs> So that's all I have yeah, to say I, I presently. Want, yeah, just. <laughs> well, <clears throat> okay, we, Haki, go ahead before Bill responds. Go ahead, Haki. I knew uh, Dr. Betty Shabana. And Malcolm loved this woman. They had six daughters. And the daughters who never really got to know their father through their mother. And Betty, Dr. Betty Shabazz, I cannot even visualize her not respecting that relationship. We used to, when she would come up to the uh, National Black Holistic Society, she came up uh, one weekend, we had it on our birthday. And so the brothers had decided that we're going to give her a present. And the present was um, a professional massage from Dr. Hapi. All right? She pulled me in that room and said, I'm not letting that man touch me. And again, it just spoke to the privateness of this woman and what she saw as important in terms of just maintaining and keeping the legacy of his memory alive in her life. 
she did go on to receive a doctorate degree. So she wasn't like some person in a jelly jar, not able to think and not able to you know, develop and not able to criticize if indeed there was problems within the context of the family. Because she did go on and the best she could, could do a marvelous job with those daughters until the tragedy happened in her life also. But what I saw as unnecessary is, number one, he don't know, he don't know what going on, went on between the two of them. But what is the purpose of it? What is the purpose of it? I don't understand it. I mean, I mean my wife and I have been together since 1969. We have three children. And we have ups and downs, ups and downs. My wife's a PhD also. And so you go through problems, but you maintain, you keep this marriage going because you know it's important. And you love each other. And from what I can tell from my talking to Betty late at night, that she loved Malcolm and her daughters. Go ahead, Bill. But the point is, what did I, I, do I don't want to, I don't, I'm sorry, excuse me, Mary. I don't want to sound like Robert De Niro, but are you talking about me? Talking to me? I mean, it's like this, this thing about criticisms around the side of Malcolm. I mean, are you talking to me? Yeah. Well, yeah, I'm talking about the statement you right. just made up there. Right. 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 And, sure. and sure. what I was talking about was about the nat about whether or not fundamentally we can have a discussion <clears throat> about Malcolm. Right? Whether or not we can look at Malcolm and look at the strengths and weaknesses of Malcolm. This is not about whether I loved Malcolm or didn't. It's not about whether I was, I mean, my, my, just like you and others, Malcolm inspired me and has been central to who I am. But there is this reluctance to have a discussion, and it goes to this question you're raising, Haki, no, the purpose. No. The purpose is to understand the man, understand his motivations, understand the challenges that he was facing, to understand issues of strategy. I mean, that's what biographies, that's what good biographies are about. It's, it's to look at the context, look at the situations and challenges someone is facing, and ask yourself, what do you think about that, and then what are the ramifications today? This whole thing about social democracy, Amir, you got to give it up, man. I mean, it's just like, I, I don't know why, I don't know why you keep raising this about because Maribel. Because it's true. Because they Maribel always left, end up on the wrong side. Amiri, Amiri, uh, Maribel left DSA a long time ago. It you never left his mind, though. See, to that's raise the this as an issue just to, to delegitimize any formal discussion. No, it's the question of the ideological, you can see the conflicts ideologically. It don't have to do with no personal stuff, it has to do with what they think revolution is and how it has to be approached. What no. you think Malcolm X was and what he was doing, right. you understand? And it's still the same thing. What you're doing is criticizing ideologically without bringing that out to the front. Bring out the ideological conflicts. Those are where we really get down. That's what we really want to talk about. I'm criticizing people who have decided that they, rather than have a real discussion about some of these critical issues in the book, would rather focus on Marable's intent, cons almost conspiracy theories, that, that this book, I mean, this whole idea that was raised by some people, why did this book come out now? Well, let's see. Oh, this guy's been working that. on this book for about 15 years. You know what? I know what happened. Yeah. 15 years ago, he conspired with the bourgeoisie to figure out that just at this moment, well, who this would book raise needs to that come out. Except a fool. No, nobody would ever raise something like that. That's a foolish Brother, idea. You should you know. reread this book, and then you'll see uh, maybe Which book? Some, this book. And then you will see some of these allegations that are in there. Yeah. I mean, let's but what be I'm real, saying Mary. is this: to say that you don't want that you are facing people who think Malcolm is a messiah, that's like a false kind of idea. It's not that's false to, at that's all. That's when to we make can't us metaphysicians discussion. in the beginning. When if you want to talk about ideology, bring it down. What ideologically are we talking about? Don't tell us we think Malcolm is a messiah. You know, that's 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 just corny. when people say yeah. that the people need icons. That is, in fact, exactly what they're saying. They're saying that there are individuals that should be above criticism. I don't happen to come from that school of thought. I happen to think that human that? beings. Who said that? Individuals should be above criticism. It was. 
don't come from that side at all. No. I don't, I don't believe that at all. I don't believe it at all. I think that it's important for us, and this is why we include you in the book. <laughs> I thought it was because of my naturally curly hair. <laughs> Gang, I think we're, we're take the course course alive or not. Yeah. But we got a, people are lining up here. The whole book is about an ongoing dialogue, debate, discussion, and it certainly uh, pertains to the people, and I see the people are lining up. Go ahead, Don. Mm -hmm. Hello. It seems to me that there's something very important that's getting missed here. And it has to do with what framework you even go at this book. I read the book. And here we are in 2012, and there are 2.5 million black people, people locked in prisons. There is an element of genocide that is at loose in this place today, so that there are sections of the people in this country who are the potential victims of genocide. There is a slow genocide going on right now with mass incarceration, stop and frisk, and the rest of it. So you can talk about Malcolm X in a way that reduces him to some relic of some bygone day, or you can look at Malcolm's history and his development, and what does it teach us about how do you get rid of this motherfucking system? You can do one thing, or you can do the other. And it seems to me, in order to do any of that, you have to confront reality. You have to actually look at reality. I am not interested and some archaic argument about, uh, uh, about silly things. You said something, Baraka, you said something I think needs to be taken very seriously, because this is something that people should read this book and learn from. You, you said the same whole thing about pointing at the nation of Islam. Let's get real. Read this book. Look at the, way, the atmosphere that was set up. You talk about loving Malcolm? Look at the atmosphere that was set up, innuendo, rumor, misinformation from the Nation of Islam. Did it come through the FBI? I don't know. I know they encouraged that and they worked on that. But to sidestep that, okay. what happened there is a dangerous mistake. No, let me finish. Let me finish. To sidestep what happened there is a dangerous mistake, and it can happen today. It is the culture that exists today, the innuendo, the, 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 the rumor, and frankly, some of the argument that's going on on the stage that's not principled. There are stakes involved here, and I'm not talking about stakes from 50 years ago. I'm talking about whether we're going to be able to actually make a revolution to get rid of this and to stop talking for, in, uh, uh, forever about bygone days and still getting our ass kicked. Thank you we need much. a revolution. Thank you very much. Thank you. Is there a question there or just a statement? <laughs> okay. Go ahead, go when ahead. When I was a teenager, I read the autobiography, and that changed my life. I read the book. What I find most objectionable is the last section, where he, his whole line is that Malcolm was moving toward, in the direction of reform. And I think that's absolutely wrong. What I think, what Malcolm, everything I remember from, from what Malcolm's history was, was that he was looking for allies. And it was a difficult situation in 1965. But if he'd lived for another year, the Panthers were developing on the West Coast, SNCC was developing in the South in a revolutionary direction. And that was why they moved on him when they moved on him because he had, the, he had, he was inspiring all of those sections that were moving in a, in a revolutionary direction. And I think we have to take that, I, I unite with that, that, that sense that, that the system takes, moves towards revolution very seriously, and they take those movements they're, they're very seriously. And to the I'll leave it to other people who are more familiar with the actual history around Malcolm, but the, the conclusion that um, it's drawn in this book that Malcolm's becoming a reformist is absolutely wrong and does a great disservice to his life to, and to our movement today. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any response? Next, go ahead. Um, you know, so with... Uh, with tremendous uh, respect and humility um, for all of the brothers on the stage, all of whom I consider my fathers, um, I am uh, thinking, uh, even though I acknowledge and respect you all as my fathers, I'm thinking of a grandmother 
um, I'm thinking of Ella Baker and the lessons um, and the principles of Ella Baker. And Ella Baker taught us that all people, uh, she reminded us that all people are flawed and that it was a mistake to invest our struggle and our freedom in any particular person or leader, which you all know well. And she reminded us, of course, not to follow people, but to follow principle, which is, in fact, uh, I believe, what Malcolm was trying uh, to do. Um, and in his attempt to follow principle and his struggle towards truth, um, one of the things that's most uh, inspiring to me about Malcolm is that he was um, self-reflexive, he was self-critical, he was self-transformative, and so in this struggle towards radical truth, he demonstrated profound uh, humility. And if there are lessons to be drawn from Malcolm's life that are relevant to our ongoing struggle for freedom, and our ongoing struggle against uh, corporate capitalism, it has to be extracted in this manner, right? In a, in a spirit of self-criticism, self-reflexiveness, self-transformation. We would not be doing Malcolm justice um, if we do not try to identify and transcend the profound limitations in his own evolving ideology, right? Malcolm was not finished, right? He was just barely getting started and he was cut short. So it's, we have to, uh, I believe, fiercely resist any kind of cult uh, of Malcolm. That does not do uh, him justice. It strikes me that this conversation is tremendously static. Um, and with all due respect, I don't think it's a conversation that really reflects um, the diversity of the black radical tradition. I mean, we have up here uh, four men, right? All of whom I respect, all of whom have made incredible contributions. But quite frankly, Malcolm uh, and conversations around Malcolm become this uh, echo chamber, right? They become this echo chamber. There has to be a way of drawing lessons from the life of our dear brother, all of whom we respect and love, all of whom we respect and love, that does not become these cul-de-sacs, um, these, these echo chambers that take place in a spirit of deep humility, deep self-criticism, a commitment to self-transformation, that is to say a commitment to the best ideals and principles that Malcolm himself represented. The conversations are too static and global capital has been dynamic, but we keep having the same conversations again and again and again. Thank you. I was born in Harlem Hospital in 1934. Lived in New York for many years and I was very politically active. In 1964, they wouldn't allow me to speak publicly in the streets of Harlem because of my views. I was arrested twice. It was in the New York Times, August of 1964. I've had my life threatened a few times in this country and I was present at the assassination of Malcolm X. I heard Malcolm X speak on many occasions from 1958 until the time of his assassination. I heard Minister Louis Farrakhan, in fact, he and I shared the speaker's platform at a university in St. Louis in 1970. I heard many Muslim ministers speak. I knew Captain Joseph, of the fruit of his, head of the Fruit of Islam in New York City. James Shabazz, uh, Benjamin Tuex, who introduced Malcolm, because I was there, sitting there with Yuri Kochiyama, the Japanese woman whose picture appeared holding Malcolm X's head in her lap as he was bleeding and dying. I heard Betty Shabazz say, oh my God, they're killing my husband. I saw the two people that started that phony argument about to, to draw attention away from Malcolm. I heard and saw them. I know someone personally who was eyewitness up in the front row, up in the, about the fourth row. I was mainly an ear witness because that was the first time I went to a meeting where Malcolm was speaking, but my intention was not to hear him speak because there was the Statue of Liberty bomb plot case of February 16, 1965, when three African Americans and a French Canadian woman were arrested and charged with plotting to blow up the Statue of Liberty, Liberty Bell, and the Washington Monument. They had a police spy on me for eight months. It's, you can look it up on the internet. My name is there. I'm in Cointelpro from, nine, from July 1964 to February 1965. I was driving a cab in New York. I heard that, these, that they got arrested, and then I organized with some other people to have a meeting because I was with the Freedom Now Party, all black political party, and we decided we'd meet at the Audubon Ballroom. Okay, that's So that's why I was there. So anyway, Malcolm, Malcolm X, though, was developing politically and a very secular consciousness. Now, he might not have ended up a socialist, but he was very sympathetic towards socialist ideas, and I know this. I could document it, and I'll debate anybody in this audience anywhere in the United States on my views on Malcolm and defeat him. So thank you. Bill Sales here. 
We're here talking about and trying to evaluate Manning's work on Malcolm X. Just a few things I'd like to say very briefly in terms of the scholarship. I think it doesn't even come to the level of his previous work. First of all, he doesn't engage several decades of work on Malcolm prior to his own. If his work is going to be definitive work on Malcolm X, he has a responsibility to do that. He had a huge bibliography in the back of that book, but in no way did he engage that bibliography in the course of his discussion. Secondly, this text is poorly documented. You can make no one-to-one -one, uh, 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 concurrence between his most controversial assertions in the text and the footnote section of the book. Therefore, some of his most controversial statements are undocumented. That's not good scholarship, that's poor scholarship. Thirdly, um, he, for writing a, a definitive work about Malcolm X, there's very little direct quotation of Malcolm in the work. And those quotations that occur on little snippets that are surrounded by paraphrases and commentaries of, of, of Manning, which essentially distort and change Malcolm's meaning. Let me just give you one e example of, of, of the poor documentation. If, as Fletcher says, there, there were three things that Manning discussed in terms of the assassination, let's take the assertion that there may have been people inside of, uh, of, of Malcolm's own organizational circles who participated or want him, wanted him assassinated. That is totally undocumented in the book. Now, were there contradictions in, 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 that Malcolm had with some members of his organization? True, right? But you can't make you know, an undocumented leap to suggest that those people were involved in Malcolm's assassination. At the same time that you make the allegation, you don't take Malcolm's direct attempt to address those those problems. There's no direct quotation of this letter that he sent, you know, from Cairo where he talked to his followers about not, you know, putting him on a pedestal and if they felt they wanted to go another way that they could. I mean, you can give hundreds of them, and I'm sure in your book and, and the other reviews, there have been hundreds of situations of just plain poor scholarship. And it's for that reason that I would recommend that everybody read the book, but also that you got to read a whole lot. All right, and that this book can't stand in the place of the autobiography. It can't stand in the place of the existing black intellectual tradition on Malcolm X. Right. Yes. Uh, Brother Amanif, who right, from right across the river, the great city of Newark, New Jersey. <laughs> I would like to thank the panel uh, for doing a remarkable job in your diversity <laughs> and opinion. I really think they deserve a hand. Remember, human nature is not perfect. None of us are perfect as we go through life. We learn from each other. And I was privileged to meet Malcolm as far back as 1959. I was a young man growing up in Virginia. I'm not from California like some people think. Came <laughs> uh, in a minister by the name of Jeremiah Shabazz from Philadelphia. Uh, used to travel together as they uh, spread the teaching of uh, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad into the southern states. They were setting up study groups you know, at that time. Uh, but I would like to say this, and maybe the panel can expound on it, is that in your diversity and our consideration of Malcolm X, which I regard one of the great men of the past century, look at his successes as a community organizer and as a reformer among our people talk by the Honorable Elijah Muhammad because no one wants to give him credit nowadays. I saw Malcolm raise up hundreds of thousands of young people, both male and female, and clean them up. Men from some of the most questionable of backgrounds, including myself. <laughs> See what you can learn from Malcolm as, a, as an organizer as a reformer, one that was able to kept clean up our people, get up off drugs, alcohol, dope, and make us responsible human beings. 
But at the same time, you have to look also at Malcolm's mentor. I don't care what happened to them eventually as they separated, but the role that Elijah Muhammad played in his development. Without Elijah Muhammad, there would have been no Malcolm X. The only person in America today who can call a million black men to Washington and damn near two million showed up was also a student of Mr. Muhammad, Minister Louis Farrakhan, but Farrakhan also helped to train Malcolm. I was around when both of them was here. <laughs> so just look at the great work. You know what that Malcolm did as an organizer. Okay, when the tyranny of the clock is upon us, Quickly with your remarks, because we got to get out of here. <laughs> okay, I uh, just wanted to desegregate this line, <laughs> gender-wise. Um, oh, uh, there's just two points I want to make. Every year, everybody genuflects to Martin Luther King, and nobody remembers the Riverside speech. Martin Luther King was against war and said this is the most violent nation on the earth. That's being erased. Um, the question of Malcolm, what nobody remembers or wants to discuss about Malcolm, is he said anybody that votes for the Democrats is a traitor to their race. Let's discuss that. He said that. And the point is, in Murray, you got up here and said, there's nothing else we can do. Mm -hmm. We've got to discuss that. We've got to discuss what else we can do instead of going with this lesser evilism year after year. And Malcolm warned, he said, do you want the wolf or the fox? Do you remember that one? Okay, I prefer you. the wolf, quite thank frankly. You. We're going to have to uh, call it a day here. I'm sorry, gang, we'll have to call it a day. You can talk to the panel. We're going to go outside, sign books for you, answer any further discussions. But we have to conclude here and get the next panel. Thank you very much for coming out. Occupy Malcolm X, all right?